Good morning friends and welcome to Rosedale Community Church with our online message. We're currently going through 1 Samuel as a series and um, I started this week with actually a video about polar bears taking their first steps. Now I've put the link to that on YouTube in the comments below. So this is the moment where you need to pause this audio and go and watch the polar bears first and then come back to me. Okay, have you watched the polar bears? If you have, you might be wondering, why on earth are we watching polar bears and what does that have to do with our message this morning? Well, today we're going to watch Samuel take his first steps as king. It's quite a bit different to the polar bears that we've watched. And just to warn you, there will be several violent references. But let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 11, and I'm going to read from verse 1. Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabeth Gilead, and all the men of Jabeth said to him, Make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and so bring disgrace on all Israel. The elders of Jabeth said to him, Give us seven days so we can send messengers throughout Israel. If no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. Just then, Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen, and he asked, What is wrong with everyone? Why are they weeping? Then they repeated to him what the men of Jabesh had said. When Saul heard these words, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent out the pieces by messengers throughout Israel, proclaiming, This is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out together as one. When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000, and those of Judah 30,000. Now, you'll remember from previous weeks that Israel has asked for a king, much to God's and Samuel's disapproval. But they were persistent and God finally agreed to give them what they wanted. It was Saul who was chosen, a fine looking, strong young man of about 30. But now I'm going to head to the main preach that we recorded in the church service. I pray this is a blessing to you. From the smallest tribe of Benjamin, from the smallest family within the smallest tribe. And he is completely untested. He's never really led any group of any size um, because he was the youngest of his family in a small family in a small tribe. But this is the man who's been chosen by God, who's been affirmed by the majority of Israel and um, to become king. So as we heard last time, he is made king and then he doesn't know what to do. So having been made king, having, if you like, come out of his hole in the snow, okay, and stuck his nose up in the fresh air, having done that, um, he's become king and then he goes back into his hole um, in the snow, he returns home exactly to the life before because nobody actually knows what to do with him. There's never been a king of Israel before. And he returns back to Gilgal farming. And he's farming there when the next scene occurs. So we're reading from 1 Samuel and chapter 11. Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabeth Gilead. And all the men of Jabeth said to him, But make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you, only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you, and so bring disgrace on all Israel. The elders of Jabeth said to him, give us seven days so we can send messages throughout Israel. If no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. When the messengers 
came to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people. They all wept aloud. Just then, Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen. And he asked, what is wrong? What is wrong with the people? Why are they weeping? Then they repeated to him what the men of Jabeth had said. So what we have here is the, the next scene, if you like. Saul has returned back home um, to his farming. As we, we, we read there, he comes in from the fields behind his oxen. He's gone back to do exactly what he has before, even though he's now king of um, Israel. And what happens here is what God intends to enable Saul to take his first steps. The Ammonites invade. Perhaps they had heard that Samuel was no longer the leader. Perhaps they decided that this was an opportunity to get hold of some extra land, resources and power. Remember, war and fighting is usually about power, you know, wanting more. And so they begin a siege of this city. And the city is Japheth, Gilead. Okay, they begin a siege of the city. They surround it. They cut off anybody being able to go into the city or those in the city going out. And the population of Jabeth is trapped inside their walls and thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? We are trapped here and all the Ammonites are around us and we cannot fight them. And so they send a message and say, make a treaty with us. Make a treaty with us. Don't, you know, lift the siege. Let us come out. Make a treaty with us. And um, the, the, they say, we'll offer our surrender and we'll be subject to you. Just let us live, you know, and let us continue here and lift this siege so food uh, um, can come in. But the enemy is not impressed. The enemy scoffs at them and he says, yeah, okay, okay, I'll make a treaty with you on condition that I gouge out the right eye of every single one of you. I know, that's some condition, isn't it? I, I did tell you it was going to be a little bit more violent than our, um, than our polar bear cubs. Okay, why the right eye? Okay, well, I want you to picture this. The majority of the population is right-handed, so they would hold their swords and fight swords, mainly with the right hand, okay? And therefore, I'm just going to use my microphone as the sword and your tambourine, okay? Therefore, they would hold their shield with their left hand, okay? And if they're fighting here, the shield is held here, the shield would probably cover the half of their body and their left eye. So they will gouge out the right eye because then without a right eye, you can't see to fight. Does that make sense? Okay. So that is why they're saying, you know, we'll gouge out the right eye. So that um, basically it would make the fighting men useless. Useless. Unless they're left-handed or ambidextrous or spend a few years training with their left hand. Okay. But um, the right eyes need to see around. So what they're, around the shield. So what they're doing in saying this and making, you know, all the men unable to fight, okay, is that they're wanting to harm, they're wanting to humiliate, they're wanting to reduce the power of the Israelites there in the city. You know, they are not interested in being nice to the Israelites. That's not their purpose. Their purpose is to destroy them, destroy them and their power, the Israelite power, without completely taking their lives, because actually they want them to, to pay them, and they want to take their food, and they'll come in and do raids as the Israelites are trying to grow. So they don't actually want to kill off and destroy all the Israelites, they want to leave them alive, but they want them in their power. They want to humiliate they want to reduce what the Israelites can do. And isn't that always the enemy's goal? Isn't that always the enemy's goal? Always. And that's what the enemy wants to do here. 
That is why Jesus summed up the enemy, Satan's goal, as being to kill, steal, and destroy. Sorry, steal, kill, and destroy. That way around. Steal, kill, and destroy. That is the aim of the enemy. That is the aim of the enemy. And that is why we should never agree or even consider bargaining with the enemy. Satan wants to get into your life and ruin it. He will use many, many different means, okay, as individual as those of us who are here. But he wants to creep in and get into your life and say, well, okay, okay, um, okay, I, 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 you know, there's this trouble or there's this happening or something here. If you just do this, do you remember the story of, um, of Jesus in the wilderness when Satan came and said, you're hungry, you're hungry, so turn the stones into bread. You know, that where he took him up to the top of the mountain and said, look, I will give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. And another one, prove, prove that your God is God. Prove your God is so great. Throw yourself off here and let him rescue you. Okay, it's very, very individual. And I can't tell you what it is that the enemy might be wanting to use in your life to compromise. But you need to know that when the enemy comes in, when the enemy comes in, he will want to compromise. He will want to do a bargain. And the bargain always, always disables you. The bargain always eats away at you. It will somehow destroy your freedom, your life, and your future. That is what the enemy does. And that is what the enemy is trying to do here. Fortunately, the Israelites realize this. They know that if they give in to the enemy, they will be little more than slaves. And so they stall for time. They stall for time. Seven days, they say, okay, we'll hold out. With the sea, we can cope with the siege for seven days and we're going to give time and hopefully the rest of Israel will come to our aid. And this is the moment, as the message goes out and the message gets to Saul, who has been, you know, appointed king, even though nobody is entirely sure what that means and looks like, and he's gone back home to farm, okay, but Saul here hears it. And this is the moment, this is the moment that Saul is going to take his first steps. This is the moment that Saul needs to show what he's made of. He's going to be king. His first steps out into the snow. Okay, I actually feel a bit nervous for him. Okay, Saul, how are you going to handle this? How are you going to handle your first responsibility of king? Actually, he does a great job. Let's keep reading it. 1 Samuel 11, and we're now at verse 6. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came upon him in power. And he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel, proclaiming, this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they turned out as one man. Then Saul mustered them at Bezek. The men of Israel numbered 300,000 and the men of Judah, 30,000. Saul. Saul is empowered by the Lord to do his job. He's empowered by the Lord to do his job. And this isn't a job that's selfish. This is a job that he had been appointed to do. He was the king of Israel now, and this absolutely was his job. And suddenly, suddenly within him comes the Spirit of God burning with a passion. With a passion. Now, passion is a curious thing. 
Passion, you know, real passion is like fire. It can be extremely good, except when it's allowed out of control or in excess. And it also depends on what your passion is. I don't know if you remember the Old Testament stories. Samson, take, take Samson for example. Samson had a passion for Delilah. Okay, which meant that he ended up enslaved with his eyes gouged out. Don't know, do you remember the story of um, ba um, Balaam? 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 His passion was for wealth. He said, yeah, yeah, if you give me money, I'll curse Israel. Yeah, he couldn't actually do it though, could he? Okay, but that was his, that was his, it led him astray, his passion for wealth. The New Testament, the Pharisees, oh yes, they were very well behaved, weren't they? Very well behaved, the Pharisees. But their passion, actually, their passion wasn't for knowing the Lord God. Their passion was for law. We've got rules that you have to follow. That was their passion. And such was their passion that Jesus called them whitewashed sepulchres. That's graves. Okay? For those of us. But then you get the ones who have a passion. A passion that God has given them. A passion for good. You think of Moses. Moses' passion was for the freedom of his fellow Israelites. Think in the New Testament of Paul. Paul the Apostle, the Evangelist. What was his passion? What caused his heart to burn? To tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he took the gospel to Europe. Passion. Passion is the fire in your belly that gives you a reason to get up in the morning. Passion, when you discover it, turns the world from black and white into multicolour. Sometimes that passion can really, really surprise you. I remember five and a half years ago when John got ill and I stepped in just to cover him for a few months as pastor. You know, it was a really difficult time, as many of you know. There was a lot of hardship, there was a lot of heartache, um, there was a lot of trying to figure out what I was doing. You know, and look after the girls and finish my degree and work my other job at the same time. Um, oh yes, and um, ha S uh, Deborah was doing GCSE, so I was homeschooling her through that. And yet, I discovered, I discovered in those first couple of months something I'd never experienced before. I realised that actually, I was taking my first steps, but I loved being a pastor. I loved being a pastor. And suddenly, the world just seemed to fit together in a way that it hadn't before. And in this moment, in this moment when Saul hears the news that there's a city that is under siege to the Ammonites, he discovers why he was born. He discovers that. He hears that the Israelites are in trouble and suddenly everything clicks into place. He knows this isn't right. The Ammonites have no right to take that city, has no right to subdue the Israelites, to gouge out their eyes and make sure that they are subject to them. None at all. His passion, his anger explodes into a righteous anger that says, no, this is not going to happen. The enemy is not going to have the victory here. It's that kind of righteous anger that we see in Jesus, don't we? When he goes into the temple and um, turns over the tables of the money lenders. He clears the temple and says, no, this isn't right. This is not what my house was made for. You know, it's that kind of anger that says no to the bully. Or to the terrorist. It's the kind of passion inside of you that says, I will seek justice and righteousness. It's the kind of passion that says, I want to see God's name glorified. His kingdom 
extended. And it is this passion, this passion that comes from him suddenly being full of the Spirit of God on him that allows Saul to take up the kingship and lead them to victory. It says here, the next day Saul separated his men into three divisions. This is verse 11. During the last watch of the night, so that's just before dawn, during the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. The passion that comes upon him, the call that enables him to say, hey everybody, come on, all of you Israelites, I want all of you. If you don't come, I'm going to come and chop up your oxen. So you better turn out. I know, that's a bit of a, bit of a stick rather than a carrot, isn't it? But anyway, um, it, does, it works, it does the job. All of these, um, all of these people turn out. And uh, at, at just before dawn, they break into their camp of the Ammonites. They start fighting. Uh, they slaughter them all and the survivors flee. Saul has got his first victory. He might be a little polar bear cub, just taking his first steps, but he takes them in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. He takes them covered by the calling that God has put on his life. He takes it empowered by the Holy Spirit, and he has victory. You know, life without passion is grey, it's boring, it's mediocre. And, you know, it, it, but it honestly depends on what your passion is. And your passion won't necessarily be the same as the person sitting next to you. Your passion might be like William, and it might be football or kayaking like Becky. You know, they feel gifted by God. And they will put in the 10,000 hours of um, training that it's required to make them elite in their sport so that they can honour God by living out their testimony in their sporting arena. Perhaps your passion is for caring or nursing people. Perhaps your passion is for teaching or helping those who struggle in some area. Perhaps your passion is to be a friend Seriously, I know someone whose spiritual gift is friendship. And she is a phenomenal friend to people. In fact, her friendship changes their lives. Perhaps your passion is evangelism or prayer or learning the lessons of history. Whatever it is, you need to find your passion. Find your passion, pursue it. Learn how to do it well. Lean into that passion. Fan it into flame. Because when you've got and know the passion in your soul, that's when you're living the fullness of life. The life that God has called you to. What's your passion? And so Saul finding himself at the first time at the head of this huge army, defeats them all and they scatter. And suddenly, we read here that he is confirmed as king. Whereas before, there had been some who was like, no, 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 we don't know this person. Now, everybody is like, oh, yeah. Saul is the one chosen from God. Have a look at, at verse 12. The people then said to Samuel, Who was it who asked, Shall Paul reign, Saul reign over us? Bring these men to us and we'll put them to death. But Saul said, No, 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 no one is going to be put to death today. For this day the Lord has rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there we will reaffirm the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and confirmed Saul as king in the presence of the Lord. 
There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. Saul, now, Saul is king. He's been affirmed as king. He's taken his first steps. People have seen that he is anointed by the Spirit of God. And he can do this. And they all say, yep, yep, he's definitely the one. Let's have a party to celebrate. You know, like we had the coronation, you know, earlier on. Let's have a party to celebrate. And that's what they do. And so we've got Saul, empowered by the Spirit of God. But I know you're asking, well, what about Samuel? What about Samuel? Well, he's obviously, hasn't he, been there alongside Saul. But now Samuel knows that it's not his job to provide the leadership. Not in terms of military, not in terms of the nation. He's still a priest and prophet, which we're going to, and he'll continue to provide that role. But now he knows that this is Saul's job to be king. And Samuel isn't going to usurp that position. Because God has said it's Saul. He has been reaffirmed in that. And Saul says, okay, okay. Now is the right moment for me to step back and do an official farewell. Chapter 12. Samuel said to all Israel, I've listened to everything you said to me, and I've set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I'm old and grey, and my sons are here with you. I've been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand, testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these things, I will make it right. No, they all said, you've not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You've not taken anything from anyone's hand. So Saul realises it's time to say goodbye because he's old and grey. That's what he says. Okay, and he says... Hey, you bear witness. Have I as a leader ever done anything to cheat you or lead you astray? Have I ever taken what belonged to you? And they say, no. No, you have been godly and righteous always. You have followed the ways of God. You've been a brilliant leader. And he, as he is, because he's a teacher, he's a priest, he's a prophet, he then says, okay, okay, so you've got to remember that the Lord your God who brought you out of Israel, and he tells the story of that, and brought you into the promised land, he's the one, don't forget, you've got a king, but he's the one that you've got to follow. And um, he then uses the weather to illustrate the danger that they will face if they turn away from God now that they have a new king. And God, this is quite wonderful here, read, read this later this afternoon, and um, God sends a huge thunderstorm and so much rain that they actually cry out, they cry out to Samuel and say, no, 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 pray to the Lord, this is verse 19, pray to the Lord your God for your servants so that we will not die. They say, we don't want to die of the thunderstorm and the rain. I know it's been, it's been terrible, hasn't it, seeing the floods this day. And I'm just, you know, how many um, this week and how many people have been crying out and saying, God, God, help us. And that's our cry too, God, help them. And that's what they say. We don't want to be destroyed with the thunder and the rain. You know, we will, we will follow God. And um, they say, we know, we know that we sinned, you know, by asking for a king. But still, Samuel, Samuel, cry out to God for us. We don't want to be destroyed. And Samuel replies, do not be afraid. You've done all this evil, yet, yet, listen, folks. All you have to do is serve God. Do not turn away from him, but serve him with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do no good. They can't rescue you because they're useless. He says, look, are you getting the message here? For the sake of his great name, 
the Lord will not reject his people because the Lord, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will be swept away. Oh, I love Samuel. He is so human. He is such a great guy. There's no sugarcoating it here. You know, he might sound like he really is a right grumpy old man. He's actually only about 52 at this time. And he is going to live and serve God for almost another 40 years. Okay, he lives to be very elderly, he lives to be in his 90s, which was a really good age for, you know, that time. Um, but, but he is no longer the top leader, Saul is. And Samuel knows that. He knows his place. He knows that he's there to pray, to teach. But he's no longer the leader. He's there to guide, to be the priest and the prophet. So he gives them this serious warning. Go straight he says, do not fall into the sins of your ancestors. Don't do it. Don't worship God. Stay with the Lord God Almighty. And I wonder if you can hear in this, and the thunder, and the rain, and the lightning, the passion that's in Samuel. What is it that he's passionate about? The Lord God. And he's passionate about the Israelites, his people whom he has led since he was a young child. Yes, of course he's gutted by the bad choices that they've made. They chose to crown a human king, and that choice feels like a rejection and is of the Lord God whom he loves, and of course, his own service. But, but, having got this king, Saul, he will never stop wanting the best for them for serving for them, for interceding on his behalf, on their behalf. Yes, he's hurting right at this moment. He's hurting because of his passion. He's hurting because he loves the Israelites so much. And yet, I reckon if you could go there and say, but Samuel, would you have it any other way? He'd say, no. No, I wouldn't have it any other way. These are my people that I love. This is the Lord God Almighty whom I'm following. This is the passion that God gave me since I was a small boy and heard his voice. It has been to speak, speak into the lives of others. That is his passion. So I ask you again, my friends, what is your passion? And if you don't know or haven't got one, are you going to ask God for one? Are you going to ask God to show you? It may not be an easy journey. In fact, I can pretty guarantee, much guarantee it won't be easy. Because living a life of passion isn't easy. Why do you think Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me? We call, we call that week, that story, when Jesus took up his cross, the passion the passion, it actually means suffering. The passion of Jesus is that he loved so much that he gave his life. But if you really want to live, if you really want to live with a fire in your soul, it's finding that passion, giving your life to finding what God, God has for you. Even now, you may think, yeah, yeah, but I feel like Samuel, I'm old and grey. Okay, that's okay. Samuel's going to live for another 40 years. I'm not saying that you're all going to live for another 40 years. Hopefully, hopefully many of you will. But, you know, age, age is not, age is not an excuse to not be passionate for the Lord God Almighty. It might change as, as we get older, 
But still God has something for each one of us to live, live life to the full. Okay? And just to wind it back round where we started, living life to the full rather than allowing the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy. I want you to think back to our polar bear cubs, just sticking their noses out of the hole, taking their first steps. And you might think, oh, I haven't a clue. I'm like that polar bear. In fact, actually, I like the mother bear one that just tobogganed on the side, down the, down the, down there. Whatever it is, okay, that's okay. God doesn't expect us to know exactly what to do right away. Saul didn't. Saul didn't. But when the moment came, and when God said, this is it, Saul was ready to hear ready to respond with passion and serve him with all of his heart. And that's how God wants us to live. So shall we, take, shall we take a moment? Let's take a moment to ask God, if you don't know, what do you want me to be passionate about, God? And if you do know, or you can dredge it up from some dim and distant past, because actually at one point, you did know the passion in your soul. Maybe ask God, is it still that one? Is that what you've got for me, God? What's, what's the passion for today? What's the passion for this week? Oh Lord God, you are the mighty one. You are the holy one. God, we want to follow you. We don't want to get trapped by the enemy who only comes to steal, kill and destroy. We don't want to compromise. But God, we want to serve you with all of our hearts. Stir again that passion within us. Stir again a passion for your name. Stir again what it is that we need to know you to, to be fulfilling your call on our life, whatever it is, and for each one of us it will be different. But stir that again, God. Remind us, and maybe for those who are here who do not know yet what it is, God, may they start that journey Start that journey to find out. Find out your call on them. What it is that you are igniting in their souls by your spirit. Holy Spirit, fall upon us afresh. Fall upon us afresh and ignite in us the passion for you.